Our scripture today is long. I'll try to skim through it. It's from two sources that relate to each other. Exodus 16, 2 to 4, and 9 to 15 is a story about the Israelites in the desert. And they were there in the wilderness with no food. So they complained to Aaron and Moses, we would have been better off if we died in Egypt, where at least we had a full fill of bread when we were there. Why have you brought us here to die of hunger? So the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. And in that way I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. And then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness And the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. So say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there was on the surface of the wilderness a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. And this is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each of you needs, and omer to each person according to the number of persons, all providing for those in your own tents. So the Israelites did so. Some gathered more and some less. But when they measured it with an omer, those who gathered much had nothing over, and those who gathered little had no shortage. So they gathered as much as each of them needed. And Moses said to them, Let no one leave any of this manna until the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it until the morning. And it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry with them. So morning by morning, every morning, they gathered it, each as much as was needed. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. The next reading is from John 6, verses 24 to 35. It's after Jesus, on a mountaintop, has somehow miraculously, with only five loaves and three fishes, fed 5,000 people. When that is done and everyone is given thanks, Jesus retreats to the mountain. His disciples take a boat across the Sea of Galilee to another place called Capernaum, and Jesus joins them by walking on the water to meet the boat. So two miracles in one day. But the next day, the people who were there noticed that the disciples had taken a boat. And they wondered, where did Jesus go? So when some boats from Tiberias came near that place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks, the crowd who saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, got themselves in those boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said, Rabbi, why did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. But the crowd said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in me whom God has sent. So they said to him, But what sign are you going to give us? 
so that we may see it and believe you. What work are you performing today? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written that he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you that bread from heaven, but it was my Father who gives you the true bread of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to this world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And he answered, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. On the surface, both of these scripture readings are all about food, that we need it, that God will make sure that we have enough, but that on the other hand, food itself is not really enough for life in this world or the next. Put together these readings from Exodus and the Gospel of John are in a way contradictory and made so by Jesus himself. Will God provide or not? Let's look closer for a moment to find out what message these passages could be carrying as God is still speaking to us today. Israelites had escaped from Egypt and the evils and burdens of slavery under the Pharaoh only to find themselves starving in the desert. So naturally they complained to Moses and Aaron, we would have been better off if we'd stayed in Egypt to die with full stomachs than to die here of starvation. Somehow that sounds eerily familiar and haunting if we look at what now is happening in the Middle East. What is happening? Where is Jesus? Where is Egypt today? The celebrations after the Arab Spring of 2011 only led to near anarchy and non-peaceful demonstrations. And look at where we left Iraq, where initially we had many supporters, but many also who preferred the brutal non-benevolence of Saddam Hussein, because at least they'd had some measure of stability. There are years of hard work and uncertainty ahead for that region as a whole. Iran and Syria are again at the top of our news feeds. But where are Tunisia and Libya? And as Turkey emerges not so necessarily helpfully from their silence, where are Jordan and Lebanon and Saudi Arabia? And let us not forget, of course, that we too in America must still face the imperfections within our own dream society which is still not equitable and just for all. The Israelites wandered in the desert for 40 years, but God did come to their rescue by giving them some daily bread, manna from heaven, which appeared miraculously every morning, and quails too, which appeared every evening. Can we count on the same from God today if only we pray enough? Well, not totally, as Jesus reveals in the story from John. The crowd who chased Jesus across the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum were looking for real bread, that which had somehow miraculously appeared for 5,000 people the day before after Jesus had given thanks over only five loaves and three fishes. But Jesus, in a sense, rebuked them saying that they'd missed the point of the miracle of the 5,000, that they weren't chasing after him because they wanted more signs of the kingdom, but because they wanted another meal. Don't work for the food that perishes, he said, but for the food that endures for eternal life. And the crowd pushed back. Well, then what are you doing then? Our ancestors were given manna. Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat every day. What kind of sign can you bring then that we can actually see and then believe? This scene reminds me of one from J.C. Superstar, which some of us of at least my generation will remember. 
when Jesus is surrounded by a clawing and needy people at the temple, will you touch, will you mend me, Christ? Won't you trust, touch, won't you heal me, Christ? Will you kiss, you can cure me, Christ? Won't you kiss, won't you pay me, Christ? See my eyes, I can hardly see. See me stand, I can hardly walk. I believe you can make me whole. See my tongue, I can hardly talk. See my skin, I'm a mass of blood. See my legs, I can hardly stand. I believe you can make me well. See my purse, I'm a poor, poor man. And over and over again, will you touch, will you mend me, Christ, till Jesus shouts, oh, there's too many of you. Don't push me. There's too little of me. Don't, don't crowd me. In the crowd, me, oh, heal yourselves. So in this sense, Jesus' reaction at Capernaum is that we really do have to work for the food that perishes. We cannot expect God to provide us with everything we need to sustain life. As my daughter quoted to me recently from a song by Drake, there is a real sense that part of the reality of this life is indeed like this. Ain't no telling when I go, so there ain't nothing that I'm waiting for. I'm the type to say a prayer and then go get what I prayed for. So when I read what Jesus' response was to the people at Capernaum, who came looking for actual bread, and then at least a sign that made it clear to them how to do the works of God, that his response was this, Jesus is the true bread of heaven, and that he said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. How is that to be? I have a hard time understanding that. What does that mean? I'm reminded of a confession that I wrote decades ago in response to Isaiah 55, in which God invites everyone who thirsts to come to the waters. And you that have no money to come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. As a young woman, my response was to, with great skepticism, say, I don't believe you, God. I cannot come to you in faith. There is no water here for my thirst except the water I dig the wells for. There is no food to buy here for no money, for nothing of necessity comes in this world without the means to obtain it. There is no cypress in my world, only the tall thorns of human arrogance. And what is a myrtle bush? I know only of the shrubs and tangles of human failure. My failure is hard to accept, Lord, for I have been taught to live for everlasting success I have been taught that I am what I do and that the only joy I know is the joy of doing well. What joy can you give to me, Lord? Only the joy of conquering despair, of seeing through the endless mire of my own finitude? How can you show me the way to find the fallibility of infinity and then still claim that all infinity is you? I don't believe you, God. You're not going to give us more bread. You say we have to wait for the bread from heaven. What does it mean for our life if Jesus is the bread of life and that whoever comes to him will never be hungry and whoever believes in him will never be thirsty? What do we do with this apparent contradiction? In other words, how do we live in this world when the kingdom is already here but not yet. In truth, we as human beings do make these societies that we live in here on earth. But we did not, nor do we not, create the world as a whole that, 
that we are not alone in. In fact, we did not make the air that we breathe, nor the water that we dig wells for. And although we cultivate or herd and then harvest, we cannot necessarily recreate what we destroy for our own needs. And though we try our best, we are not always successful at everything we do. Nor does what we accomplish always turn out to be for the good that we intended. So then we often find that we must pray for what we cannot handle, for what we cannot endure, for what we absolutely do need help with. And when we find that we are not alone, but yet that others do not see us or account for us or work for the common good of us all, we then find that we do hope and believe that God will come, that God will come through in some way to make us and to make them change for the better. There is another lesson to be learned about the manna that was given to the Israelites in the wilderness. It was only sufficient for what each person needed for each individual day. Those who did not follow the instructions and tried to gather in more than what was needed for each day found that whatever part of the manna was left for the next morning had bred worms and became foul. Thus, it's important to remember that what we gather together here on earth for our own food and drink and shelter cannot be taken with us to what comes next after this life. As far as this society of ours is that of our own making, making and limited by our own finite imaginations of what can be conceived, we should not fail to notice that the structures and the systems that we are living with in today in the USA have not always been the same as what they are here and now, nor will they be the same in whatever ways we intend or cannot foresee in the future. Let it be known, for example, that the origins of the Advocate Health System came about as a mission of the Evangelical and Reformed Churches, which later became part of the United Church of Christ, and that its facilities, like the hospital still named the Deaconess Hospital in St. Louis, were originally staffed by celibate Protestant nuns, who, like my two great aunts, Pauline and Frida, served as nurses with no pay as their full-time witness to love God, their full-time witness to share the love of God in this world. What happened to the service model for healthcare when the business model took over? Will the economists and the politicians take note of other models as they continue to try to come up with a better one for our healthcare than what we have now? I do indeed hope and pray so. And indeed, if the University of Chicago could begin to see itself as not only at the forefront of, a me of, a, of medicine, but also to see who it is on its own front porch from the neighborhoods around it, imagine, imagine that this magazine called Imagine sent to the current residents surrounding the University of Chicago, which advertises their greatness in developing new treatments for numerous bodily ills untreatable in the past, wasn't necessary. And that the university didn't have to work so hard and spend so much money for expensive glossy paper and mailings to be respected and admired in this community. Imagine that the University of Chicago Medicine housed and trained emergency doctors skilled in treating traumatic injuries so that ambulances from the south side did not have to head north, more than five miles away, up Stony Island, Cottage Grove, King or Lakeshore Drive, and that helicopters flying over Hyde Park carried in not only donated organs, but adults needing skilled specialists in emergency situations. Imagine that the city, county, state, and federal sources stepped up as well to help ensure that UChicago Medicine could give what is sufficient for each day to those closest and most in need of speed and uncommon skills and equipment. 
Imagine if the help were there when needed for the victims of gunshots, speeding cars, accidental falls, and sudden fires as well as for those for long-term illnesses and especially funded diseases. I was lucky when struck by a speeding police car as a pedestrian while nine months pregnant 32 years ago at 63rd and Woodlawn to be taken here to Billings Hospital because it was still only a neighborhood hospital that ambulance brought you to the closest of. I was lucky, or I should say blessed by God, that my son was born alive to be told the tale. And I was blessed again four years ago that my daughter's sailboat accident where she found herself fighting for life at night in the waters of Lake Michigan without a life vest happened off the shore near Northwestern Memorial Hospital and not down by Jackson Park Harbor for when she was finally found and taken to the trauma center at Northwestern by ambulance the next morning. I was told that she only had minutes to live. As it stands at this moment, holding this magazine and what it represents, it feels this morning like it's breeding only worms and has become foul, foul. So we say to the university, enough is enough. Bring us the bread of heaven. Do what you can, not what you wish to be known for. Help those around you in need. And so we pray and do other actions, but every Thursday, we pray to God at 58th in Maryland. God, let those who are wise and powerful see the truth. Let their cup be filled with love that will mend our souls as well as our bodies. Finally, in truth, we should also take note that when we do have moments in our life and in our shared lives together that are cause for joy and celebration, it is important to remember that what is good and abundant for us is cause also for thanksgiving to God for what we have, usually, not always, only of our own making, but is the result of the gifts of many others who teach and mentor and care for us. There is a saying that to, to whom of us much is given, much is expected. There is one understanding of how Jesus managed to feed the 5,000 with only five loaves and two fishes, which we've heard Pastor Julian say many times in this sanctuary as we anticipate one of our potluck suppers approaching. It wasn't some magical miracle that was only God's action that day, but the realization of those in the crowd who had already brought food, that they had in truth brought more than what was necessary for themselves alone that day, and that when Jesus gave thanks for what only one of them had brought, the rest of them shared amongst everybody what was sufficient for all. So when we raise our hands and praise and thanksgiving to God to fill our cups and let them overflow, realize that we are not simply asking for more wine, but as in the song which Regina sang for us, we are asking for an overflowing of love to share with all that will mend our souls. And so too, when we sing later our final hymn at the end of the service today, that when we as believers break the bread, when a hungry child is fed, we praise the love that Christ revealed, living and working in our world. For the love of Christ that we share in this world is the bread of heaven, and that if we look around for what we already have, it's sufficient for all. Let us pray. Holy God, may we recognize that you are here now in this world and that we all have gifts to share for the good of us all. May your will be done and your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.
please reflect in silence for a moment about what you have and what you need and what you can share.